Welcome back to Genetics in the Paddock with Emily. I'm your host, Emily Johnston, and I'll be taking you along on my journey to learn about all things genetics in extensive livestock. Last season, we explored the foundational aspects of genetics. We discussed everything from basic genetic principles to practical applications on farm. This season, we're kicking it up a notch. Today's guest is Sally Martin, who is the Managing Director and Senior Consultant at Sheep Metrics. Some of the topics we're going to discuss include the importance of a balanced and holistic approach to genetic improvement, the variety of technologies available to sheep producers, balancing data with visual assessments and more. This is an episode I can guarantee you want to stick around for and one you'll enjoy. So with that, let's get into it. So welcome back to another episode of Genetics in the Party with Emily. Today I'm joined by Sally Martin, who is my guest speaker of the day. So thank you so much, Sally, for sitting down to have a chat with me. I'm really looking forward to recording this podcast. Well, thanks, Emily, for the opportunity. It's great to be here. Thanks so much. So I guess I'll let you do the honours of introducing yourself. So where, what exactly are you doing um, at the moment? Where are you working? What's your experience? Give me a bit of a rundown of, yeah, about you. Yeah, thank you. So I actually grew up on the Monero and my family still have a sheep and cattle property grazing predominantly on the Monero. And I guess that's where my interest in livestock and particularly sheep, thanks to dad, came about. My Where I'm currently at the moment is young, so in the southwest slopes, and we have a business, uh, Sheep Metrics, that we predominantly work with commercial and ram breeders uh, to helping them navigate the kind of data collection, genetics and implementing stuff on farm. My background also was with New South Wales Ag and working as a sheep and wool officer for a number of years, which I loved and, you know, just in terms of the progression, in terms of where we headed from there. And so I've probably been doing the same thing for a fair while, which might give away my age, so I'll leave it at that. <laughs> But yeah, look, I love working with the diversity of people within our industry and there's always something, you know, one, it's the beauty about agriculture, you know, no week's the same, no month, no year, we've got all these other challenges, of course, which does make it a bit tough at times, but yeah, the, the diversity, I think, in in what we, we do is pretty cool. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Even in the role I'm in, I feel like every day is just so different and it's always so exciting just with new fresh things happening. And yeah, it sounds like you've had a a really great career in that, Sally. So you said you're based in Young. So what areas do you guys work with or service with Sheep Metrics? We uh, predominantly, we do a lot of data collection. So I guess if you're in a kind of a three hour, four hour radius, we probably will get to you. But we also work with a number of other people that are interstate and I've also got a couple of overseas clients that we work with remotely. So with the way that technology is these days, you're able to communicate by email and we were doing Zoom meetings before COVID. So those technologies exist and we are able to tap into different people. Software, we work with different software options that allows us to have real-time interaction with clients when they're capturing information and being able to do something with that overnight if then they need to go back and make decisions the next day. So there's there's a whole range of flexibility, I suppose, where you actually don't physically have to be on farm, but that's also a component of also what we do. So, yeah, a fairly broad spectrum of client bases across Australia and a couple overseas. That's really exciting and I feel like technology has just made life so much easier in that sense where it does give you so much flexibility which as you said like extends your reach as well and how many people you can help which would be really interesting just to be able to yeah work across different areas too. So going back to you you kind of mentioned a bit before that you guys work a lot with the data collection side so how do commercial breeders collect and utilize data on farm and yeah I guess second to that what tools are essential in managing a RAM team effectively? Yeah, it's a good one. And with EID coming in across Australia, Victoria's already got it, but I think what that's starting to do is to get people thinking about how they might capture some information. I reckon 98% of our clients already use electronic tags as part of that of capturing that information. So 
working out, you know, what's important, the timing, when you're going to capture it, but really in terms of when you want to use that information to make those decisions. For commercial breeders capturing information, it's slight, it'll be different to a ram breeder where we want it, the ram breeder to be collecting as much information on the full cohort, whereas at a commercial level, I would be you know, going through and, and taking out any of the, uh, you know, the dead set culls visually, you know, anything that's not going to be structurally, you know, meeting your breeding objective and then start measuring and then going from there. In terms of then overlaying that with your RAMs and making sure that there's a great tool with RAM Select in your RAM Team Manager, so we're tracking our RAMs, I think that's probably a key tool that, that people can use then to complement what they're doing with their with their use and yeah so they're, they're probably a couple of kind of areas that we we work with commercial breeders in that space and do you guys also work a lot with the seed stock breeders as well we do we've got a, a number of ram breeders that we work with across different breeds and we're also working with a few goat breeders as well and again, it all comes down to what your what your environment is, what your current breeding objective is, and then working out the traits that are going to be important. So with the ram breeders, we're looking at capturing that information at critical times where they would be interested in making those decisions. For example, a critical time in terms of what I mean would be if you're interested in early growth, well, you need to capture that that, that those body weights at that early age but also there's a lot of people that are interested in capping adult weight for example so we need to make sure that whatever the program is that we set up with a different client one it's tailored to, to meet their needs and their breeding objective in their on their farm with their sheep in their environment and a, there's no right or wrong with a breeding objective because it's quite a personal thing but there are then ways that we can look at then when th other things are happening in the calendar of operations if you like in terms of when we would capture that information to m really then come back to when you want to make those decisions. Yeah that makes sense and it's really great to hear about just how personalised a breeding objective can be because I'm sure you have a lot of clientele and a lot of their breeding objectives would be very different as well, even if they were neighbours, for instance. Yeah, it's really, really interesting to hear about that side of things as well. I did want to ask you a little bit about, I guess, like mulesing. And I wanted to know what your thoughts were on what the main benefits are that are observed by breeders who do adopt a non-mulesing approach. And also, how does the market influence breeding programs yeah so the, I guess I'll go from the latter to the um, your, your initial uh, um, question so markets do have a have an impact and we saw pr premiums for, for non mills wool we're not getting as strong a signals probably at the moment however again it's it there's a um, you know fly strike in in Australia is a challenging issue that we, we have to deal with and we're going to get variations within seasons. Again, it comes down to people's, you know, are you, are you, why, why would you go non mills So are you doing it to chase the market? Are you doing it to give you more potentially flexibility in your marketing or things like that? And then working out, I think, for people to go down that non mills pathway, really having a clear plan and a staged approach. For a lot of people that have gone cold turkey and then had other situations where it, you know this, they might have not have been prepared for certain seasons to come in, that that is quite challenging to deal with. So making sure that your sheep are ready, you're ready mentally as well. Um, you've got certain things in place, and it may be we've worked with a number of breeders that have transitioned to go non mules, and it may actually be just moving crutching a couple of weeks if you can and talk and having that open communication with not only your wool brokers but your shearers and, and everyone else who's involved in the business becomes really important so being able to I guess know what are some of the, the also the favorable traits that that are going to go with what that non-mules animal might look like 
versus unfavorable traits and, and then how you can best manage it. So there's no one size fits all. Yeah. Um, and it depends on where your starting point is to then what strategies you might put in place to be able to then end the time frame. You know, do you want to stop next year? Are you? Do you have a 10-year plan? So, and everything in between. And unfortunately, it, it's not that prescriptive. And and then again, you know, managing those risks that, that also come about with, with some of those changes. Yeah, it sounds like there's a lot to consider. There is, <laughs> there is. But, but if you start thinking about it as a whole farm, you know, and, and where everything interacts, and again, keeping coming back to what your breeding objective is. You know, if it is still, if it is to go non-mills, you potentially will have to compromise in certain areas. But again, it's having that balance yeah. and knowing where your income streams potentially come from to be then be able to go right. Well, I'm going to focus a little bit more in this particular area, or how your country's set up. Do you have paddocks that are going to be more fly prone and and managing that whole chemical kind of area as well so mm. yeah it, it it isn't simple but it can be simplified and and managed yeah no that sounds great it sounds like yeah there's a lot to consider but it's definitely achievable for a lot of people especially if you look at it as a whole of system approach like you just mentioned when you're considering genetic progress kind of linking to what we just spoke about with you know having other operational goals as well but how do breeders balance the speed of genetic improvement with their other operational goals yeah, another real, that's a good one. So how we would, I guess, tr- tracking our RAM team is probably the predominant area. Uh, are we and balancing that with what other areas that, that are important on farm? So it's got to be a balance. And coming back to maybe what you get paid for and what in terms of if you're looking at you know cost savings or anything like that is there are there ways that you can utilize some of uh, I'm thinking you know genetics initially how how do we um, make sure that we're making those right genetic decisions so the cumulative over time and then what those flow on benefits are and potentially maybe even what those reasons for change might be. Is reducing costs, is that because we're having trouble getting labour or are we wanting to, we're increasing production in certain areas? Sounds like there's a lot of considerations there again, Sally. And I think, as you said, like earlier in the episode, it's important to understand why you want to do that. And yeah, try to find a great balance just so everything continues to flow on smoothly. So... You've been in the industry for a little while now, as we spoke about earlier. So how have the genetic tools and technologies evolved over time? And what are some of the most significant changes you feel like you've observed? Probably the most significant change, like Bruni values have been around for a long time and we use them in so many other industries. But, you know, they use it in tree breeding, salmon breeding. They actually, there's a movie called Moneyball, Brad Pitt in it, and they, it's about a baseball team in America. And they actually use the same concepts to pick a baseball team. Anyway, that's an aside. But I'd say DNA and genomics are probably the most you know, exciting things that we've got that we can start working with. For us as an industry, having a really good reference population to be able to inform that. So that's having animals that have been genotyped, so DNA tested, as well as being measured. So um, we've got that phenotypic information. But it's what it's allowed us to do is to start measuring, but also selecting for very hard to measure traits, for example, intermuscular fat. And we've got some abattoirs now that are starting to pay a grid where we've got improved. They're actually paying a premium for good intermuscular fat and lean meat yield, as well as where kind of this lies for the future will be potentially methane and our carbon intensity. So I think, yeah, that, that whole genomic area and where commercial breeders are tapping into that is like with flock profile and that we've already got in the beef industry where you can take a DNA sample and you can actually get a a genomic ranking on an animal like with heifer select so you know those type of technologies are going to start coming into the sheep industry for not only 
commercial breeders, but t- potentially you know people who breed their own rams and even people who don't want to c- completely go down that ASB, the Australian sheep breeding value pathway, it does give them some other opportunities. So is it safe to say that genomics will essentially help breeders make early and cost-effective decisions about maybe traits that are harder to see visually as well or measured later in life? Definitely. And reproduction. is a, we, we know it's lowly heritable, but we can actually start, we can still select for it and make those genetic progresses because that is cumulative, as we talked about before, over time. And But it's something, for example, with a ram, we need his daughters on the ground and measure them to be able to give and infer what his reproduction options that he's providing with his genes to the next generation. So 100%. It, it gives us, I mean, you know, my vision would be that we take a DNA sample at landmarking time and know by weaning whether we keep or colour. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that sounds very cost effective and just, yeah, being able to see that so early on would be able to, like you'd be able to make such great informed decisions at that time. Yeah, our biggest challenge probably in the industry is price point in terms of what the cost of that genomic test might be and then how we, you know, what that cost is and then what people perceive or, or not, not necessarily the perception but what that value of that information is early on so if we can start looking at that cost benefit which is you know some of the stuff that we're starting to look at now that will also help people I think look at how they might integrate it into their operation you you may not have to be testing everything but you might have layers or tiers within your enterprise so even having it you know it doesn't have to be a blanket thing you know a blanket tool that's across everything but it could be strategically used you know it could be and utilized in different ways I suppose. Yeah I was just about to ask so with the genomic testing especially when we're just talking about you know doing it at lamb marking would you genomic test every animal or like you just said would you have layers or tiers or how would you select which ones to actually do? It's a good question. And again, I think it would come back to, well, what are your numbers, but also what your breeding objective is. Are you a seed stock, you know, ram breeder or, um, you know, a seed stock breeder or a commercial breeder? And yeah, where where you fit within that? So I don't know that there's one particular Mm -hmm. answer. And again, I come back to what is it, what, what's the question you want answered with it? Yeah. And then I reckon that would help to potentially answer your question for, for individuals. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So there are a lot of genetic tools available, including genomics. So how do you feel like breeders should navigate the array of these tools available to find the ones that best suit their specific operations? I'd probably come back to having a clear breeding objective or production objective and, and what traits are important to you to then going and how how quickly we want to move. So having a, and we talk about this being, you know, a smart breeding objective, whether it's um, specific, measurable, all time bound and and all those things. So I think that being quite clear about that and and then looking at potentially the and the environment that you're working in, there's a number of tools and, and, and they're not overly complicated. Well, they are actually behind the scenes, but how you can utilise them can be potentially streamlined. And yeah, so I think for commercial breeders purchasing your rams with breeding values, your ram team manager, tracking your ram team, do so now's a great time to get out there, do a roll call of all the rams, get your ram team updated so that when you go to the sale, you know which rams. That, or you have an idea in terms of what your benchmark is. We want to increase certain traits or decrease certain traits. For example, we might want to decrease fibre diameter or wrinkle, but increase intermuscular fat or fleece weight or something like that. So we've got a benchmark in terms of where our current RAM team is because average of that RAM team is giving us an indication of what the progeny should be doing in five years' time given flock structures and genetic lag and all of that. So I think that's a key thing. If you if you're a, a breeder who doesn't purchase rams with breeding values, you can still do a flock profile, which gives you an indication of where your flock sits genetically. 
within the industry. So that again gives you an indication of where where your flock's currently at. So there's, I guess, they're probably the, probably a couple of the key tools, and then whether you're capturing other information on farm that you can actually look at what your year on year kind of trends might be over time. Yeah, that's some great advice, Sally. And I think just mentioning that the tools are actually simple to use for the end user is really great as well, because I think the idea of them can be sometimes quite daunting. But as you said, like when you kind of get your head around it and understand what you're looking for, they can become really simple to use and great for yeah being able to basically select what you want when you're going to make a huge decision such as purchasing a ram. So around this time... There is a lot of like talk about data as well, but how do we balance the use of using ASBVs or these sort of genetic tools with visual assessments? For a commercial breeder, I'd be thinking of, in terms of visual assessment, if we're just looking you know, at the animal, is it, is it fit for purpose? And commercial breeders, I, we usually take out the anything that's structurally not not suitable for farm or isn't meeting going to meet our breeding objective in terms of I guess a, a quick once over we might take out say 10 percent and then we might measure the rest to then get other key production traits that, that we're interested to then take out the next kind of tier or layer that might go to another enterprise within our farm it might go you know be sold off farm so in terms of visual assessments we've got and you could utilize the visual score guide which we've currently got available which gives us our you know usually a one to five one often being maybe the more desirable and five not being as desirable you could actually utilize that to give you some more robust data rather than just oh yeah i like that one or i don't like that one so if you want to start i guess delving down for people that really love their data (laughs) Again, it, it is that balance. I I don't work with any breeders who just use data. I know a lot of people, it can be a very flippant, generalised comment that, oh, you know, all these, you're just using the data to, to you're not actually looking at the animals. I actually don't know anyone who just looks at the data. Yeah. I would suggest that most of the ram breeders that we work with, I'd say 50% potentially may be culled out, looking at them visually, whether they're fit for purpose and for a various number of reasons. You know, it might be 60-40 or 40-60, you know. But, I, yeah, I don't know anyone who just looks at the data or the yeah. figures in isolation. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. And I feel like, as you said, just... Balance. Balance sounds like it's key here in just considering everything that you need, especially when you're just making that huge decision as well. And it sounds like you have a lot of conversations with producers on the ground. So I thought I'd ask, because I'm quite interested, what are some of the common myths that you feel like you hear around data or breeding values or any of these sort of genetic tools? And why do you think they exist? I think they, yeah, I do, do hear a lot of that. We're probably really good at generalising and sometimes pe- yeah, people will say to me, oh, I, I, you, you know, you guys, you just use the data. And I'm thinking, oh, well, I'm sure you use a fibre diameter to make a selection. Well, that's a piece of data. I reckon it's probably lack of confidence. They maybe don't trust it or they've had a bad experience. And that, and, and I think that lack of understanding. And where I find, I remember talking to another of different people and I reckon sire evaluation is actually one of the best extension tools in terms of looking at some of these genetic uh, in terms of the power of the breeding values and and where all this fits in that so a sire evaluation the way it's set up let's say we've got a thousand ewes and they're either maybe let's say they're they're from one or two drops and we randomly allocate them to the size that are in the sire evaluation so then they're artificially inseminated to these these ewes. We've got let's just say we've got fifteen sires that have been evaluated, and then they all lamb down. Those, those ewes lamb down, and we measure the progeny. Whenever you get, if you get an opportunity to go to a sire evaluation field day, they'll usually be drafted up into their sire groups, and the power of one generation with one ram can have on those particular ewes, I think, is 
you can visually see the differences. So we can actually start looking back at, well, what were those breeding values of those rams prior and were they actually predicting what the, what the progeny ended up doing? And you'll get some variations because of the environment and things like that, but effectively, you know, I think for people that aren't really sure about it, they're a really great way to be able to go and see what those differences are. And I think it's just starting. And there's a number of people out there that can help and guide people through it. And it isn't it's simple. It is quite complex, but it can be simplified. Where I like to kind of take that complexity with the science and actually help people put it in on farm and, and be able to actually apply it in, a, in the practical world. Hmm. Seeing a SAR evaluation must be really, really eye-opening and just to be able to walk around and have a look at them in groups as well and see the change, I think that is a great tip for people to go out and have a look at that, at that if they ever get the chance. Just to, I guess, as you said, like build confidence in the technologies and just be able to see it for yourself as to what's actually happening on ground as a result of using these two. So, no, that's that yeah. sounds really, really interesting and I'm sure a lot of people listening to this will definitely be interested in hearing about that and I hope from this podcast we'll go and have a look at one if they ever do get the chance. So I guess we've spoken a little bit about some of the technologies as well, but I'm interested to hear what your thoughts are on using indexes and if you've used any sort of in this space, what improvement do you, do you notice after using them? I'm sure it's similar to using the ASBVs, but yeah, I'm interested to hear about your thoughts on some of the indexes that are available. Yeah, indexes are, um, uh, we have a lot of discussion about indexes, I find, in the industry in terms of, what, you know, whether they're the right ones or, you know, is there enough emphasis on certain traits? And I think of an index as the headline in the newspaper. It gets my attention and then I read the fine print, which is the breeding values. So I... Indexes are a ranking tool and there's a huge amount of work that actually goes into developing them. You can have an index with two figures, like uh, say a, a, a fleece value, which is basically giving us an indication of, you know, micron and fleece weight. Where our industry indexes come into place is that they're actually based on a production system. So, for example, we've got four new indexes in the merino industry now and we've got ones that are have... That are, that are aiming to be more fine wool and then ones that are more focused on land production. So, you know, they're the two kind of extremes and others in between. Where I find indexes really interesting and I saw some information the other day where in the terminal industry where they brought in eating quality into the indexes, I find if you can utilise the index better is where you start getting these antagonistic traits, uh, so unfavourable traits actually moving in the direction that we want to. So the terminal industry example is potential, intervascular fat was going down and sh- shear force was going in the wrong direction. After they've in- included eating quality in the indexes, we're actually having them go because they're antagonistic. So we're actually finding that they're going, we're getting better into muscular fat and shear force is improving. So I think as an industry, they start to help us achieve greater things across, you know, we're not just picking on one particular trait because the ramifications is, you know, where everything else starts to fall off the edges if we don't keep pressure on something. So where I think potentially this might, you know, and the complexities of production systems and the indexes that have been generated through sheep genetics has been definitely a huge amount of effort in in trying to get those production systems as close to reality with what we're what we're doing on farm and then there'll be some other little tweaks I'm sure along the way but I do find in particularly for commercial breeders they're a really great way to go right well let's identify those animals that are you know ranking in the the areas that we want and then we might fine tune with looking at a few of the different individual breeding values to be able to go right well these these rams are actually meeting you know like we talked about our ram team before meeting those benchmarks to be going in the right direction for for all of the traits that are important in our breeding objective. 
they sound like a great tool, at least like as a starting point, just to see what animals fit your production system and get a bit more of an idea. And can you also, do you think you can use indexes to kind of help form a bit of a breeding objective or try and figure out, you know, what might fit your production system or is it usually the other way around? I probably usually go the other way, but I think the index isn't necessarily the breeding objective, but it complements what you are, yeah, what your breeding objective is. And again, it is, it's just a tool. It's another tool. It's a Mm -hmm. ranking tool to be able to, to, to try and identify those animals that uh, and, and so what it'll be is it'll be basically bringing all the breeding values into one number. So instead of having to, uh, you know, juggle 10 breeding values where we're looking at one number and then we might go, right, well, if we've got the same index on an animal and we're thinking, oh, which one should we get? There may be one that might be better for a particular trait in comparison to the, the other. So, you know, that helps us with our selection pressure, I suppose, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense and sounds like a valuable tool to just take a lot of the complexities out of a lot of breeding values that might confuse a lot of people in the beginning when you go and have all of these numbers and it's just like which one do you start with looking at first yeah interesting so I guess as well going back to what we're talking about where you probably have a lot of conversations with producers I feel like sustainability is a bit of a hot topic so I'd love to ask you like what are your thoughts on I guess the industry from a sustainability point of view or how you might see the industry going in terms of sustainability or if there's any sort of chatter about that yeah I just I'm interested to hear what your thoughts are on the whole sustainability piece so it can be a uh, that word can mean a lot of different things to different people when I think about sustainability I need to make sure that my business is sustainable but you know I'm also sustainable within the environment so where I guess the challenges will be in terms of kind of this whole carbon space and talking about carbon intensity and how we can potentially use some of the genomics to be able to help identify some of those key traits but we still need to feed the feed and clothe the world so being still very you know productive and i think through efficiencies it will start to come in which we're already doing but there'll be the more I think we look into things the more we go oh we should need to measure this and Mm -hmm. we need to measure and I think it'll be probably finding the key things that are going to help drive the system forward without making too many compromises I suppose which again we keep coming back to that balanced word but if we don't have an environment that we're looking after, you know, we want to be able to look after the environment. We want to be able to have continue to be valued, you know, agriculture to be valued by greater society and and be doing something proactive that, that's going to be, you know, for the, for the better good, I suppose. Yeah, that makes complete sense. And I feel like balance has been the perfect keyword for this episode, <laughs> especially yeah. in terms of sustainability. I think that's those are some really great insights there, Sally. I guess my next question might kind of link to that one, but this is something that I kind of ask everyone at the end of my episodes. But what do you see the next 10 years looking like? So if you had a crystal ball and you were looking into it, what do you feel like the future holds? The future? Oh, yeah, it's a good question. So... I hope that the future holds lots of positive, <laughs> lots of positive talk. We need animals and, and people and businesses that are going to be able to cope with a lot of change potentially. So, you know, is that rapid change? Is that more subtle change and being adaptable? So I think having animals animals, people and businesses that are going to be, yeah, able to adapt to change quickly and be versatile, I think. So, for example, you know, if we talk about flood and drought and flood, you know, animals that can cope with a lot more rain as well as still survive in a, in a, in a dry climate, yeah. So, a lot of work still to do and but I think our selection in terms of where we've come from, if we have a look at, you know, some of those older photos in terms of what we what we used to have before, but 
as a business, we need to be thinking about labour efficiencies, and and I think a lot of the new technology that's coming, yeah, you know, we've got with how sheep handlers are helping, and 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 some, you know all of that kind of area, and um, you know a lot of our RDC, our research development corporations, and you know even uh, you know Department of Ags, and you're doing research in that kind of kind of space in terms of helping it with it with any of those efficiencies. So yeah. I think. That, that would be probably my answer at the moment. It could change, you never know. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to re-ask you in a couple of years and see what your answer changes to. But no, it sounds like there's going to be a lot of challenges but also a lot of opportunities and a lot of change. I think change is not always a bad thing. It can bring a lot of good as well. So I think it'll be exciting to yeah keep watching this space and see what does happen. Yeah, I think there's a lot of, lot, a lot of change to be made. So thank you so much, Sally, today for sitting down with me to have a chat. I feel like we've covered a lot of interesting topics and a lot of had a lot of great discussion. So it's been really great to sit down and chat with you. I've, I've learned a lot and I'm sure everyone listening has also found a lot of insight in this. So thank you because I'm sure you're very busy. So I appreciate this, this hour that you've set aside to chat with me. Oh, well, thanks, Emily. I appreciate it. And look, I think it can be quite daunting some of these things that we've talked about but it, there are people that can help you which I think as an industry you know we're pretty lucky we've got a we've got a pretty good network of um, people and support out there and good luck <laughs> <laughs> thanks so much Sally I couldn't agree more there's so much support out there and yeah it's, it's great to see that all coming together so thank you again so much And that brings us to the end of this episode of Genetics in the Paddock with Emily. I hope you found our discussion as enlightening as I did. This episode was produced by the extensive livestock genetics team within the New South Wales government. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider subscribing to our podcast on your favourite platform, leaving us a review and sharing it with your friends and colleagues. Your feedback and support help us grow and reach more people who are passionate about livestock genetics. If you have any questions, comments or suggestions for future topics or people you'd like to hear on the show, please feel free to reach out to me on emily.johnston at dpi.newsouthwales.gov.au. Thanks again for listening and until next time. Mm